All right, so if you were here last time, which is two weeks ago now, we covered broadly the idea of Musar. Does anyone remember what, does anyone who was there remember what that word means loosely? Discipline, yeah, like comes from the word for tradition. Um, but it is, it's a practice that kind of goes in and fills the gaps of the Torah. So the Torah will give you these commandments, but it doesn't exactly tell you how to keep them. And it doesn't tell you how to keep them optimally. That's what the oral tradition is for. So from the oral tradition, the Jewish oral, oral tradition, rabbinic, comes all the explanations of how to keep the commandments of God and become that holy nation God charged his people with multiple times, but it, you know, in Deuteronomy. Um, and many times you'll see, as we mentioned last time, uh, Yeshua's teachings are not exactly anything new or challenging to keeping the commandments. He's teaching you how to keep them better. And we're going to look at this next week in more detail. But for instance, he'll say, you've heard it said, and he'll mention a biblical principle. Um, it's called Deoraita, when it comes right out of the Torah, like the literal meaning of that. But I will tell you, and he gives you a very hard elevation to that teaching, right? So a lot of what Yeshua is teaching is Musar. Um, and that was last week. We looked at the... Um, yeah, so we're going to do this. We looked at the history. So it, it's an ancient tradition, but, you know, in the way that time has gone on, um, it's become more prominent, and at times it has emerged as a new kind of school of thought. And with that, the father, he wouldn't call himself the father, he's a very humble person, but is Rabbi Israel Salanter. Beautiful stories of him. I shared some last time. Um, you can look up his work. You can look at his biography. You'll get a ton of stories, but he's an amazing person in this space who really takes the, what'd you call it, the, the elitism, the elect intellectualism of his day and tries to right set it with how we interact with people, never really losing sight that how we interact with people is important. Um, something we're going to talk about next week, I made a little shift. I was going to do something else this week and um, I pivoted, but I want to focus on it more. How does this all tie back to Adam's sin and our current reality? Right, because it has a lot to do with Messiah and the times that we're in, especially the times we're in, and how that all of that holiness and purity are part of the equation to getting to the next level for elevating ourselves, both individually and as a community. Further study, I don't know if anyone has picked any of these up or if you own any of these books, I would recommend starting here, if this is all brand new to you, Everyday Holiness, an amazing book, and... Um, Dr. Alan Marinus has a website as well, and he has a lot of in information and resources, and he does a really good job of kind of making it practical for people. Um, there's a Torah Musar com commentary. Basically, he pulled together a bunch of rabbis, and each week they go into the Parsha, and they find, they extract the particular um, personality trait, the character trait, or the Musar component. And then these other two are very, cl they're classics. They're Everyone always starts, I'm, I'm in this boat, Masilat Yasharim, Way of the Just. We get a running start. I'm going to finish this book. We, we get two chapters in and we fizzle out because it's challenging. Okay, so um, Derek Eretz, you've heard this before, right? Has anyone heard this? It means the way of the world, the way of the land. It's kind of a strange uh, phrase, literally, but what it kind of means is sort of... Um, Decency, it's the way things work or the way things should work or just that's how it is. It's kind of the way it's used. Um, Derek Eretz is an ancient Jewish principle that refers to the decorum and dignified behavior that the people of Israel should have at all times. Now, from in the Jewish tradition, um, this would, we'll go through some verses here which kind of lay this out. But it's a very important concept. It's actually essential in all we do. And it actually precedes the theological. So you don't have to be very versed in theology. Um, the teams, I've asked you all to be here this week because we've already laid the foundation for some of this. We've spoken about purity. We've spoken about the way we set ourselves apart from culture. The way culture kind of has a different, uh, we'll talk about this later, way of the world. Culture has a different way of going about life. What is it that we do and what is it that we can do as a community to set ourselves apart in a godly way. And even though it's not the theological, it comes from that soil. You can't argue that 
to love your neighbor as yourself isn't the soil that this comes from. And the beauty is these can all be taught. You don't have to know Talmud and Bible. or to, It's all Torah, but it can be taught. And we know this because we teach kids to hold doors. We teach kids to say yes, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, yes, sir, no, sir. We teach them that, and they don't understand the practical um, reason we do that, but they can learn those practices. So these can be taught. Next week, we're going to get into Mido, uh, character traits, and those are a little more challenging. Does it make sense? Okay. So a little bit more on this. Um, manners. You could roll the word manners into this. So as a community, what would be our community standards? What would be accepted civil customs of our community? Um, you've heard the word mensch. Mensch is a, it's a Yiddish term for what it that's what it should that's what you should be. Yeah, a real person. So it's funny because in the Hebrew it's an Adam Shlema, a complete person. That's the Hebrew version of that. And that means somebody who's just really getting this down. They're doing what God wants of them. And you can find people who aren't religious can be a mensch. Right? It's possible. Um and like I said, we're going to talk about this more, but these are easier to engage with than me do. And I want to build on this because there's a really fascinating um, set of uh, ethics we'll, we'll talk about today. And you'll see what I mean. These are two books, Perkyavo. You can find Perkyavo in our Siddur, or you can buy your own version. There are many versions that have commentaries. I would probably get that because you just get a little bit more. They're excellent. These really dive into um, their carrots and Musar. Now, in the, in the Jewish world, it's all Torah, right? Mystical teachings, Perkyavo, the legal material. We like to, in our modern Greek Hellenistic minds, we like to divide and label things and put them in different sections of the bookstore. In this world, it's all Torah. Everything comes from that same soil. And this book is great. This is actually good for kids, too. So parents, if you are interested in this one, um, Reb Noach Weinberg's uh, 48 Ways to Wisdom. So he takes one of the sections, I think it's um, Perkei Avot 6, and it gives you 48 statements of what a mensch looks like, of what per a person who is getting this looks like. What do they do? What sets them apart? And he makes uh, actually 50 chapters, which you could expect. You get a little more than um, 48. But it's an amazing book. And it, again, it's not overly theological because this is... This is just how you become a good person, a complete person. A quote I love, being Jewish, and you could say being a person of God, is like a second floor of a two-story building. Some people try to build the second floor without building the first. Right? Like you can do commandments, and we see this in the New Testament. You can be keeping commandments to the highest degree, to, to the point where nobody can keep up with you. But if you don't have that first floor, um, being a good person down. Something's wrong. You're limiting yourself and you're, you're not doing it right. And last week, I think we laid the foundation. Foundation is sort of understanding what all of this is and why we engage with it. And this week, we'll do the first four. Cool? Make sense so far? In Leviticus Rabbah, when you hear this many other places, Der Eretz preceded the giving of the Torah by 26 generations. That makes sense. What do you think that means? How does that? What does that practically look like? Do we see this? Do we see decency and manners before Moses? Who and how? Any examples? Yeah. Yep, the forefathers. I would say that uh, Abraham, with uh, the virtue of Hakkas uh, Elohim, hospitality, uh, is, is from the. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Noahide laws, some of those would fall to the Yeah, again. Yeah, and it's funny because we, we look at laws as different than this. Because it's, it's really hard to find a line. But yeah, I would say for sure these are ethics. 
Uh, the example that comes to mind is Joseph fleeing uh, advances, unwanted advances from Potiphar's wife. Remember, there's no commandment, thou shall not commit adultery just yet. And he's very clear that what he's being asked to do is absolutely inappropriate. Yeah, and there's, there's a tradition that says if we hadn't have kept falling, and we'll talk about this next week, if we hadn't, as a people, kept falling from Adam's created status, it happened multiple times, it's, it's possible we wouldn't have needed a Torah. But eventually we got to a point where God said, here, you need some help. Uh, but the patriarchs seem to embody the essence. And it was, it was actually that which made them suitable for the Torah to be given to their ancestors and for all the promises. So it's very important. Some examples. Said Abraham. Uh, Rivka, she brought water not just to strangers but to their camels. So we see treating animals nicely, considering animals, what they need. Uh, Moses was a humble servant. People tend to laugh at that verse. Moses was the most humble person. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a true statement. He uh, many times demonstrates his humility. And Aaron... <laughs> The peacemaker, he goes out of his way to continue to try to bring peace, um, you know, and so on and so forth. God, there's, there are many times Moses is talking and Moses is giving God his plans of what he's going to do. And God, like, like, a, like a father, just lets him finish his statement. Like he doesn't already know where he's going with this and he hasn't already seen it. Right? So the sages, they joke and say, yeah, well, God taught us not to interrupt people. When he listened to Moses, he could have just said, how do you know what you're doing, Moses? I got to go. Right? He's busy. But he, he held it and he held his tongue. So things like that, and we'll talk about this. He, we learn hospitality, caring for others and animals, um, humility, putting others first, uh, peace, shalom, as Peter was talking about earlier, and not interrupting people. These are all the ethics that come from their parents and before the Torah. James, can I have one? Yep. To go back to Abraham negotiating for the cave to bury Rachel. So honoring this is the mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wonderful. And that Brad was uh, hinting at that. There, there are a lot of these things between the lines. When you go back and you read these interactions from the patriarchs, don't look at them as old historic things that happen, these old boring stories. Look at the ethics that are being displayed. That's why a lot of these stories are there. Good, Drew. I think also um, when God appears to Abraham, uh, Abraham as, uh, I guess, a, a guest in his, uh, in his tent, um, he... he puts forward the idea that you know, you're going to have a son next year. Right? And uh, Sarah laughs at it. And she makes a comment about, I won't have a son, or how can I have a son, and then my husband's too old. And God, um, he, he, he relays it to, to Avraham, but he leaves out the too old part. He, he, he doesn't gossip. He just takes the, the necessary part, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah and I have um, a section for the Shon Hara, so someone remind me of that, Drake. That's your job for next week. Uh, because there is something beautiful in that. Trust in me and you shall fail. <laughs> well, Heather gives me things to remember all the time that I, I warn her. Soon. So let me give you an example. Um, there's a rabbi. He's invited to a, a very wealthy person in his community uh, to their home for Shabbat. And he brings his students. And as the custom was, the food is brought out. And the rabbi, the, the guest, gets to ladle in the first uh, and this is their custom, right? This is their, their manners. He, he ladled the first into his bowl. Um, but this rich person, even though they keep Shabbat to a very high degree, they're also known to be kind of harsh to their servants. They don't exactly treat them with the highest level of respect. Right? So the, the rabbi has a problem. He pulls the bowl up and he smells instantly. There's something wrong with this. She, the cook put something in this that shouldn't be there. It was an accident. There's no way you would do this. So he ladles out the first into his own mouth, and he finishes all of it in front of the guests. They're gasping. No one has ever acted like this. He's acting kind of animalistic. He finishes the entire thing. And the cook comes out, and he says, this was the most interesting cholin I've ever had. Can you make us more? And she goes back, and they make more, and they, they break their bread. In the meantime, they have their, you know, they have other food. And Everyone's just kind of shocked. This is not the behavior, especially not what they expected of a holy person. So on the way out, his students, who held their tongue, by the way, they didn't make their teacher look bad. They didn't say, what are you doing? You know, like they, they held their tongue. And they said, okay, are you going to tell us about that? 
what, what, what was going on back there? And he said, I smelled, it smelled like gasoline. I, I don't know what she put in it, but she, she ruined it, and I didn't want her to get fired. So I finished it, and I knew that the next one wouldn't be like that. And it wasn't, in fact. That she, saved, she was saved. She didn't lose her job. And the students held their tongue. There's a lot going on in that story. The students held their tongue. They didn't embarrass their teacher. The people at the table didn't embarrass him or kick him out. Right? There's a lot, of, a lot of these dynamics moving. And <clears throat> in essence, we learn, um, uh, I would say chiefly honoring others, but also something to the effect of, like you said, Drake, um, saving verbally what you could have said. Right? Don't make them look bad. Just we'll, we'll solve it. I'm sure there's something else going on. Give them the benefit of the doubt and look at that as well. Ooh, Perkyavot again, chapter 3. Rabbi Elazar says, if there, if there is no Torah, there's no Derek Eretz, and if there's no Derek Eretz, there's no Torah. What does that mean? He takes this up a level. I'll give a more modern example. Um, a very notable figure in recent history who can be almost single-handedly credited with the abolition of slavery, William Wilberforce. Most people don't know, but one, many people do know, because there's been movies made about him, et cetera. He was a, a very passionate Christian, right? Uh, he took his faith very seriously. Uh, what many don't know is that his other ambition, in addition to the abolition of slavery, was the reformation of manners. So <clears throat> you would think, like, okay, here you have this extreme form of oppression, and manners? It's, a, it's like a non sequitur. It's not. It's, if you treat everyone with dignity and respect, you're going to be less likely to want to enslave them or X, Y, Z. Yeah, wonderful. Um, in fact, at the top of this list goes back to what you're saying, the, the Tzalem Elohim, the image of God. If everyone has the image of God, if everyone is the image of God, you're going to treat them differently than, than you would um, and these are some examples. Okay, modesty. Modesty is something our culture may not have as an agreed upon value anymore. I don't know that that's something I can say modern times has maintained um, as much as past generations have. Humility, being careful with others' time, making people wait, being late. Those are all ethics that are not respecting others. Speaking too much, sometimes just talking, you know, we have rules in our family. If you speak past a certain amount of time, you're, you're, you're out of bounds, you're out of alignment. So we try to, myself included, keep our, our <laughs> conversation short. I'm, you know, introverts are probably like, yes, I'm nailing that. But <laughs> that's an imbalance too because you need, you need to test yourself. You need to be in those situations. You, you need annoying people. You need rude people to learn how to deal with these. Right? It's a, there's a give and take. Um, Although some people are much better at it than others. I'm already talking too much. Um, <laughs> not interrupting others, right? So that's a big one. Um, as kids, we've heard, don't interrupt, don't interrupt. But then as, a, as adults, especially in the Zoom world, so I work remote, in the Zoom world, it's impossible. Probably four to five minutes of a 30-minute meeting are, oh, no, you go ahead. Yes. You, you, right? Because it's, it's, like, impossible. But nonetheless, there are people who just power through and pick up the pieces later. Answering, no, no, I, look, I don't have a watch, I don't have an Apple watch, so don't feel triggered by this, but um, you'll see in conversations with people, you're talking and they do this. Now, when I was growing up, if someone did that, they just put their, like, as you're talking and they're just looking at their watch, you would think, am I boring you, right? right? right. I'm sorry, am I, you know, did I miss something? So things like that, like subtle little messages we send without thinking about it. Um, you could also put in here, Somewhere in here, being present, right? A lot of times in modern society, we'll have our phones out. And when, unless it's an emergency, uh, maybe we can stack them. Have you seen that before? People put their phones in a stack in the middle. Some restaurants even have a place for it. It's kind of cool. Um, I don't know. These are just the kind of ethics in modern culture we would look at and say, okay, our family, we don't do this. We don't have our phone at the table. And we've been better about that in the past. Generally, we try to do that. For a number of reasons, there are ways you can um, find um, protections, hedges, if you will, to be present with people. Um, showing respect for elders. When I grew up, that was a big thing. 
I don't know that that's so much an ethic today, but is it letting elders, you're shaking your head, no, I think I agree with you strongly, um, holding the door for people, letting certain people go up the steps first, right? Um, letting people go eat first or grab their food first. There's, this is in the Talmud as well, uh, a re um, respect for elders, you show a deference. There's a person who has, they're older and they have gray hair. That's an amazing thing in Eastern traditions. In Western, we try to bury gray hair, we, we, right? It's, it's just, we have a very different assumption about old age. Old age is sort of the, ooh, don't get old, it's tough, right? But there's a, there's a beauty in living a long life and acquiring wisdom. And, and that definitely parallels, uh, I mean, if you look at the point in history, at least in America, but throughout the world, the 60s was when that happened. You know, you, you I, I love Bob Dylan, but he's a classic example. You hear him, like, making fun of, like, you know, and, and very, it, you know, snidely doing it uh, of people of, with gray hair and et cetera. And now he's one of those, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not familiar with this music, but I'll take your word for it. I do, I do think that the 60s were a pivotal change from these worldviews, but I, I don't think they're, they're irrevocably um, damaged to the point where we can't, as a community, and if we can't agree on that as a community, as a family, or even as an individual, say, I, I am about these five, ten things. These are the things we will do in our family. Um, honoring parents could be on here uh, as part of showing respect for elders. And of course, in the Torah, honoring parents is one of the two that has a unique caveat that it will go well with you. Uh, being careful with other times uh, we have been uh, taught in school don't steal someone other time mm. because you won't be able to return it back yeah, stealing yes, time yeah, yeah that's it. amazing and uh, right and so where did you learn that actually in school that was yeah. in uh, Israel Israel yeah. um, very nice there's, a, there's an amazing story in the Talmud as well um, Dama his name his first name is Dama I think it's in Kiddushin he is a Gentile who has a particular stone. It's a very precious stone. And apparently the, the, the priests realized they lost one and they needed one and he's the one that had it. He's a Gentile. His father is related to the city council. He's wealthy. He has a lot of power and clout. And the rabbis say, yeah, he has one. So let's go and like take some money and we'll, we'll go negotiate with him. We'll buy the stone. So they go to him and he's sitting out front and they say, hey, um, do you have this type of stone? He says, yes, I do. So we'll buy it off you for 100 dinars. And the man goes back. Dama goes in the house. And he comes out a couple minutes later. And he doesn't have it. And they say, oh, no, does he want more money? We'll give you 200 dinars, 1,000 dinars for it. It's very important to us. And he turns around. And he goes back in the house. And he comes out with a stone that time. And he gives it to him. And they try to give him the money. And he says, no, no, no. We, we agreed on 100 dinars. My father was asleep. And the reason I couldn't get it before is I didn't want to wake him up. Right? So he could have made a lot of money there. And it's, it's about honoring your parents, but it's also about just keeping your word. There's so many dynamics in here. Sometimes these, these stories, this Agatic literature in the Talmud seems very simple. I mean, I'm sure it's a so, I'm sure it's, con it's concealing and deeper teaching, but it functions beautifully and very dynamically on the story level. And we can learn from that, right? Um, giving others the benefit of doubt, this could be a week on its own. You see, you see someone going into a place, you know, not a place religious people, people of God would go. You can assume the worst. I think often people assume the worst. Or you could say, I'm sure there's a good reason that he's in there. Maybe someone lost their keys and he had to go in and get that for them. Right? There are a hundred reasons that it could be. But giving someone the benefit of doubt also gives you the benefit of doubt, right? This is, this is that dynamic of above and below. Uh, when you judge others fairly, you're judged fairly. When you forgive others, you're forgiven. We see this many times in the New Testament. <clears throat> um, just two verses on this, two that I love. Baal Shem Tov says, just as we love ourselves despite our shortcomings, we should love others despite the shortcomings they have. Right? So we have a kind of double, maybe more double standard of how we view the world. And we sort of, we navigate the gauntlet and emerge 
pristine and, and clean and we don't make any mistakes, but we know we do, but we judge others to a different standard. Um, and then a tractate I'm going to talk about more, uh, Derek Eretz. Zuta in the Talmud, judge a fellow in the scale of merit and don't turn the scale against him. So this is the even scales, right? You could go back to the Torah and say, oh, well, that's, a, that's a biblical principle, right? Even scales? Yes, measure for measure. And what I find, well, let me ask you a question. When Paul is teaching in all of his letters, now never mind the context of each unique community, where is he getting these teachings from? Is Paul just a really gifted guy in these areas when he's teaching people? Or is he pulling from a well somewhere? Well, we, know we know he studied, studied under Gamaliel. Yeah. Very mm-hmm. notable figure. Yep. Learned Parush. He's a learned Parush. Yeah. He has a lot of traditions to draw. Yeah. I don't think people are often aware of this. They often see Paul as sort of this brilliant person who, and he's brilliant. But he's pulling from a source. Go ahead, Jay. I'm not going to interrupt you. I'm okay. going to interrupt you. I was just letting you know that I'm in queue. Do you hear me? Sorry, you can hear me. We haven't we we learned these yet. Um, yeah, so when you go into the letters of Paul, Paul is not creating. This is my. I'm going to. I'm not a spokesperson for TikTok. My position is. He's not making a new religion. Paul is pulling from the tradition he knows, and he has a problem. The Gentiles have not been given the Torah commandments, right? Acts 15 clarifies that. But what they don't have is some kind of a civic, a civic structure of culture and manners and decency because they're coming from different cultures. So he's doing his best to take... Torah principles and give them what they need to know to function as a community so that they can then grow into a stronger community. And they're having a trouble, they're having a hard time with the basics of that, as we know, um, particularly in Corinth. But you will see when you read Paul's letters, you if you take it and you try to align it with a genre of Jewish writing, a lot of Paul's writing is Musar and Derek Eretz. He's not teaching halakhic material. He's not often teaching how to keep the commandments. There are times you could argue maybe he was because they didn't have a Mishnah yet. This wasn't agreed upon. But he is teaching them how to be good people. So I'm going to show you some examples. Okay, sensitivity to others. This is a very important ethic that I don't think much of, much of the world has, but you will see it in Orthodox communities and some parts of the church. They, they have an awareness of other people that is welcoming and it's inviting and it's beautiful. Um, for one, uh, in the Talmud it says, a person should not weep when among those who are joyous or be joyous among those who weep. So you're at a funeral. Right? It's not a time for laughing and running. We've all had to do that. Take kids and quiet them down and sit them down and explain, hey, this isn't the time for that. Romans, to a people who didn't understand this, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Right? Makes sense. Be aware of other people's emotions, where they are in life. You could even say, I mean, I've seen this in, in my life, someone is having a hard time having children <coughs> and someone having no problem having children. And it's that there's estrangement in that relationship because this person's joy is deepening this person's sorrow. Now, there's not a lot you can do for that, but there are a lot of things that you can do to make it worse, Right? Or someone who's lonely, they're not in a relationship, and someone's just one after the other. You, there's a, there, you have to be sensitive to these things. This is what the Torah is telling us. One should speak the praises of others and show concern for their money, and, and you could say well-being, just as he's concerned with his own money and seeks his own honor. Philippians 2.4, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. So what are we learning here? I mean, how you can take money and zero in on money, but we're talking about everything. We're talking about someone left their lights on in their car. We're talking about a friend who, um, I don't know, there's a picture of them online, and it's not a very flattering picture, right? Text them and say, hey, 
someone just posted that, maybe you can have it, take it down. Looking out for the honor of other people. Um, being aware of their belongings. And this too, again, it's not religious. You don't have to be religious to employ that. But if you go back to someone whose livestock has gotten away and is walking down the road, that's a mitzvah, returning that person's livestock. So you can see where these, these are being mined from the Torah. Now, many books in the Torah, Leviticus or whatever, people have not really spent a lot of time in them. I know someone doing the, actually a lot of friends I know who do the Bible in a year. It's like, how's it going? Genesis, I'm almost through it. How's it going? Exodus, I love it. Leviticus, how you doing? You know, it's like, but if you look at the principles that are being taught in Leviticus, this is what, this is what you can pull from it. If you know how to read it in that way. Honoring others, okay, a little bit more of the same, Perky Avot again, I think. You can read Perky Avot in about 40 minutes if you stay on it. And it's a very powerful book. You'll get this, you'll get all this material. Let the honor of your uh, fellow be as dear to you as your own. Don't be selfish. Try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. How do these relate? Any, uh, creatively, how do you see these two working together? Humility, maybe? I'm just going to zero in on humility. Don't be selfish. The honor of others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. If you hold yourself on a higher level of degreeing, uh, d- d- deserving honor, you can't hold others to that. So you might be kind of... make sense? And you can zero in on these. I think the reason why there's so much silence around this one is because this is one of the hardest to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. And we all know. <laughs> oh, yeah. And don't, again, I said it last week, last time we were up here, um, we were studying this. I am just going through these myself. I'm not an expert on this. Um, Heather can tell you. But what I'm, what I'm trying to show you is, even though these in the literal and the Peshat seem different, <clears throat> it's the same ethic behind the words. Uh, the Midrash says the Torah was written with black fire on white fire. I love that. The black fire, the letters. But the white fire is all of the ethics and the beauty behind the black letters. Behind the literal words is a world, an ocean of ethics like this. <clears throat> so you have to learn how to read between the letters. That makes sense. Okay. Um, I want to do this. I want to take this one and let's... Let's go through this. I'm losing my voice here. Let me take a sip. All right. So you will see when you look at the letters of like Timothy or Titus or even certain sections of uh, Paul's letters, they read exactly the same way. <clears throat> the characteristics of a wise person are that he is meek and humble. Where have we heard that before? What comes to mind? You just free association here. Yeah. And also the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yep. Okay. So we so we have Torah, we have uh, Tanakh, and we have New Testament. Um, alert. James. Hmm? Oh. oh, good. I wasn't calling you James. The book of James. Okay. <laughs> it's a good book. He, he says that in so many ways. It, well. it reminds me of uh, Micah 6 8. He has shown the old man what is the Lord. To, you know, love mercy, to walk humbly before thy God. Yeah. You know, so that reminds me of that verse. Yeah, and, I, you know, I think you'll find that these these themes, if you were to group them, there are only a few, but they're scattered and rephrased in, in, in so many different ways. But humility is, is it is a hard one. Um, <clears throat> in our time, it's very hard. Alert, desiring to learn. So somebody who is like with it and you, you're looking for these opportunities and I think desiring to learn is more than just reading a book desiring to learn is in those situations you're looking for the way to handle it right? this person just did something to you you know what you want to do but you're going to learn through this okay. having a teachable spirit <coughs> teachable spirit and yeah. like in desires to learn like being teach- teachable like accepting instruction or um, accountability or correction 
Yep. It's funny, you just reminded me, um, when I first started coming out of where I was and into this world, uh, a good friend of mine connected me with his uncle, who is a rabbi in the UMJC, a very well-known teacher, professor, rabbi. And the very first thing he told my friend was, is he teachable? Because he's not going to waste his time. And I felt like that's a strange question to ask. Now I realize that if you're not teachable, all these internet battles and debates, if the people aren't teachable, it's you're wasting your time. Pearls before swine. Not to call anybody swine. I'm sure that's... I didn't say it, though. <clears throat> okay. Modest. Modest. What does modest mean today, especially in our culture? Can, like, can you wrap your mind around how out of control that has become? Staying off of OnlyFans. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I won't even mention it. Not even going that deep, but yeah, that's a... Um, we have apps that enable this to just completely be thrown out of the window. Monetized, even. Can you imagine what that does to the soul? But just, just the everyday things that people wear. Modesty. <clears throat> uh, beloved by all. That's tough to achieve, to achieve, but if you're a good person, where's, where's Lloyd? Lloyd is one of those. Lloyd is serving. Okay. Lloyd is one of those people. Lloyd is beloved by all. Right? Now, some people just have that built into their software. Some of us really have to really have to work at that. Right? But do we agree that you can just see that there are people who they get it? Um, humble to members of his household and sin fearing. Why members of the household? Why would they oh there's Lloyd. Hey Lloyd. Everyone's looking at Lloyd now. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll fill you in later. It's a good thing. All right, so why would, why would they specifically say members of the household? We tend to not, yeah, we hurt them most. We tend to not hold them to the same standards we hold others. I wanted to go back to modest, and we have this phrase, if you've got it, flaunt it. And oh. it's just so, you know, right, you know, things that you would only show to your spouse, you want to have the entire world, you know, looking at. It's just, um, you know, it's scary, and it's hard to transmit to our children when they don't, they don't understand. Well, like, so I have a blog. And I know, I was just thinking about this the other day, as a marketing person, someone who has a lot of experience in marketing, I know what sells. I could have a lot more money if I were to play into that. But we know the cost of what that does to you on, on a cosmic, on a soul, cellular, I like that word, someone said cellular uh, <laughs> level. And it's not worth it. And we just, we couldn't do it. But there are people who, they have no, they don't have an ethics system like this. And those get more likes, more shares, more comments. And that's what's monetized. People make money through YouTube and ad sales. And it's just that's, it pays, literally it pays in the physical level. So it's really, hard to, it's really hard to go against that when that's what kids are competing with, right? It's challenging. Um, so I'll go through this a little quicker. You judge someone fairly. There, there again is the judging others favorably. According to their deeds, you could say their reputation, who they are. I know them to be a good person. I'm not going to assume the worst based on that person. And there are times when you say, yeah, that, that person may have done that because they're, they're, when you lay out their deeds, it's just that's sort of that's consistent. And we would be careful in certain cases. But most of the time, you judge people fairly. Assume that you would have done worse if you were in their situation. Or assume that what you think happened didn't happen. Um, we were talking about this with the kids. So when I worked in the church for a while, they had, they had some of these ethics baked in. I don't think they understood exactly how they all went together, but they had them. One of which was girls and boys and men and women don't stay in the same room together without the door being open or without a third person. How many lawsuits and harassment cases have happened from that situation where there's nobody else to prove X and Y didn't happen. Or just the fact that 
you see two people in a room with no one else and the door closed or whatever the situation is, they emerge from that room together. That looks really bad. I saw so-and-so with this person. And even though nothing may have happened, that can destroy relationships, friendships. Um, people can uh, be subject to a whole world of accusations that will ruin your life. There are teenagers who were accused of something that happened at a college party. And their life, good luck getting your life back on track. Because whether it happened or didn't, most people don't judge others fairly. So we protect ourselves. And the church had that ethic, and I think it's a beautiful thing. Another one is um, Shomer Nagia. Does anyone know what that means? Guarding of the touch. Guarding of the touch. You just don't touch people. Like there are these pictures of Keanu Reeves with crowds. Like let's say this is a person. He's doing this. He's not touching anybody. So people always joke, is he Shomer Nagia? Like what's his story? But I think it's just a beautiful protection. Now, <laughs> and lawsuit. <laughs> protection from a lawsuit. But there's, there's an ethic there of just not touching people, right? We can all think of examples. I don't think of any people in particular, but you, you've all experienced this before where someone did something that went a little bit too far, and it, you just can't get that back. Once that's lost, you can't get that back. <clears throat> okay. Sits and studies, I'm going to move ahead, um, soiling his cloak at the feet of the scholars. You've heard that, the dust of the rabbis. The dust meaning... Um, you're serving them, but also like just the, the fragments of information you're gaining from them. What we're learning is keep good company. Be with the people who are doing good things. Learn from people that know more than you. Again, wisdom. People who've been around a little bit longer. In, in him, her, no one sees any evil. So they're just good people, right? Because they've protected themselves. They've been modest. They've looked out for the honor of others. And they're just good people. You can trust that Whatever they're doing in life, it's probably good, unless it's incredibly out of character. And then you can say, well, I'm sure something happened. Again, same tractate. This is hard. If others speak evil of you, we'll talk about this next week more, Lashon Hara, because this is a really challenging one. There's an entire book on this, but I'll talk about it next week. If someone speaks e evil of you, an don't answer them. Don't reply. Don't return insult for insult, you could say. Make, make, a, make your minds pull a verse up. If it's a serious offense, regard it as a slight. If you spoke evil of others, on the other hand, don't regard it as a slight. Regard it as serious, so hold yourself to a more accountable level than them. And, and go and pacify them. All right, you see how the, the table is turned, it's on us. We forgive easy, <clears throat> but we hold ourselves to a higher standard. Make sense? This is an important one <clears throat> for most of us. Um, this ship has sailed a long time ago. Let not your behavior during adolescence be of blemished repute. For this would be derogatory to the Torah. Again, Torah broadly speaking, the ways of God. But let it be unblemished. Uh, for this glorifies God. So thinking of how we, how we act as kids, how we act as teens, how, how we start ourselves on this path now is important. What are the ethics, right? Parents, this is where we, and, and the community, what are the ethics we're going to hold our kids to and our family to? Because this is the path for them. And the way that you set them up now impacts them later in a big way. So what does that look like? I'm running out of time here. Can we go to 115? <clears throat> okay. Sorry, it's getting dry. I think it's this. Okay. Not looking at you all. Um, do good deeds for the sake of their maker. So do whatever you do for the glory of God. Make sense? Not for what you get from it. And in the, uh, the Perkyavu we did last night, we, we came across that verse. Don't do things because you get paid for it. Don't do things because someone might elevate you for it. Do it for the sake of God. Um, do not make a crown of Torah. So I'm paraphrasing this. What does that mean? How do you make a crown or an axe or a spade of the Torah? What does that mean? Any thoughts? Have it with you at all times. In this sense, I think it's a, um, it's a negative. It's the, the sin that uh, Jesus charged, Yeshua charged the Pharisees with of parading your good deeds and also laying heavy burdens on others while not keeping 
those uh, those commandments themselves. Yeah, for their own personal gain. Right. In it's very simple terms, just misusing the Torah, basically. Whether you use it for good or you use it for evil, but it's really misapplying it in, in some way, shape, or form. Because like this, this sounds a lot like for Kehavot, you know. Mm -hmm. Kehavot says something very similar. It says, do not basically tout the observance of the mitzvot, because for this purpose you were created. Yeah. Like, what's the big deal? That's what you're supposed to be doing anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I find it interesting that, that uh, they would use that choice of word, um, make not a crown of the Torah, because in other places they say there are three crowns. Yeah. The crown of priesthood, the crown of kingship, and the greatest of them all is the crown of Torah. Yeah. And here they say, don't make the crown of Torah. I mean, don't, don't make the Torah a crown, rather. So context, it's in, right? in a negative context. So... so it's sort of like the Bible verse that says, speak not to a fool lest you be like him, or rebuke a fool, rebuke a fool lest he be wise in his own eyes. So it's like, oh, which one is it? You know? Both, right? Right. So context. <laughs> Did I see that? Yeah. What I first saw in that was to adorn yourself, to, to don't use it to lift yourself up. I mean, I mean to haughtiness. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. To become the authority, to become knowledgeable, become. That's one thing. And don't use it as a weapon or a tool for your own purposes. Um, I see people do that to their children a lot. <laughs> yeah. Mm. This is a not to make a crown. This is not to make a crown wherewith to adorn yourself. In other words, that it's, it's a matter of the heart. Self advancement. Yeah, self advancement. But if you're making a crown, you on others, or first of all, on a Hashem, then that's, that's, right. that, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. So it's making a king of yourself. Right. Now, spiritual leaders fall prey to this potential because you are, I mean, you see these, I'm not going to say denominations, but just see mega celebrities who their knowledge and their community has raised them to a pedestal. That's a very dangerous place because you could be doing this, and indeed it has happened, and as a result, people have fallen a very far distance from that country. Like in the gospel where he says, oh, Lord, look at me, I tithe, and I'm great, and I do all this, and I'm like, the sinner over here, the back of the door above me is at, at these like rulings. And he was humble and repentant, and he says he's the one that was God blessed the God's sight. Really yeah, it's missing the point. All right, so I have this last uh, hands up here, everyone. Okay, okay. I'm just going to move ahead here because I'm not going to have time for all these. This will be the last one to think about. Seven characteristics in an uncultured person, somebody who's not, who's not exactly understanding or aware of the, these ethics. And they, the Bible gives, I'm sorry, the, the tradition gives many of these. Perke Avod in the later chapters, uh, four types of this person, four types of this, ten of this, all right? You can look at them, and they're very interesting. I would, I would recommend doing it. A wise person does not speak before one who is greater than he in wisdom and number. So letting other people speak ahead of you who are wiser. Now, when you hold others to a higher standard than yourself, that's everybody, right? Where, does, where do you draw the line? But at least you're thinking about it. At least you're thinking the other person. It's not everyone for themselves. Um, they don't interrupt the words of their fellow, like Drake did to me earlier. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, they're not quick to answer, so think before you speak, right? So someone asks you a question, you don't have to be the first one. Think about it. Put some thought behind those words. Hmm? It's not Jeopardy. And also think, you know, some of the Hasidic masters say, are these words valuable that I'm about to speak? Right? Um, you ask, in a, this is an interesting one. It sticks with me, I don't know why. You ask in accordance with the subject, so you stay on topic. You know, calls people to go off on a, probably in a teaching setting that's very challenging. Like you, you're trying to, as a teacher, rein people back in, and someone just keeps throwing questions outside of the bounds, and it's, it can derail you. And you answer in accordance with the accepted decision, right? So there's, there's a context to that. Five, you speak on the first point first and the last point last. So keeping things orderly, right? It makes sense. It's logical. What's that? Don't confuse people. Yeah, it's good for conversation. It's good to stay in, in, in balance. Um, 
Concerning what you have not heard, say, I, I don't know, I've not heard that, right? So this could be when someone asks you, did you hear what so-and-so did last week? No. And I don't want to talk about it. I didn't hear it, didn't, right? Or it could be um, someone asks you a question because they think you know the answer. You don't have to make up an answer. You can say, as uh, I think Perky Avalot says this as well, teach your tongue to say, no, it's the Talmud, uh, somewhere in, else in the Gemara, teach your tongue to say, I don't know. Get very, hum get very um, comfortable with the idea of saying, I don't know the answer to that. Rabbis, um, I don't know exactly where it is um, between uh, truth and shalom, uh, which is which is the greater virtue. And it comes to a wedding feast, and um, the particular, you know, the, the, the husband to be, he's getting married to a woman who's in, in, in the, the sages pull the punches. They say she's just not the best looking person, and uh, so. There's this dilemma of truth versus emmet versus shalom. And so what is of greater value to tell the truth? Do you always tell the truth in an absolute sense? Yeah, so that's the famous um, <clears throat> Hillel and Shammai debate. Yeah. Do you tell a groom his bride is beautiful on a wedding day? And Shammai says, don't, just don't say anything that's not true. If she's not beautiful, it's theoretical, right? I don't think he's thinking of anyone in particular. <laughs> um, but he says, like, just don't say anything that's not true. I mean, maybe it was. I'm, I'm just giving the benefit of the doubt. Um, so say something that is true. This is a beautiful way. Right? That's kind of his point. And Hillel says, well, that, like, unbridled, raw truth is corrosive and destructive to society. So there are times when you have to um, be sensitive to that other person. And you can say, and his answer was on that, um, for, for that groom, she is absolutely beautiful today. Right? Does it make sense? Yes. You had a question? That you said just what I'm married now for things. Yeah. So in our world, absolute truth is destructive. So there are times when you're stuck between that duality. Well, I, think, I think there's something to be said about truth and shalom kind of not being even able to occupy the same space for too long. Like if, if, if the Satan were to come in here, and say to half the room, I'm going to tell everybody, I'm going to tell all of you all of their secrets. And it'd be telling the truth, but it, would, it, could, it could create a, a fracas. You know? Yeah. yeah. And, and we'll talk about this next week because that kind of goes into the Shon Hara. Yeah. The Shon Hara can also be when it's true. Because in this world, in this fallen, um, as you were praying earlier, this fallen world, Peter, the world, as the Kabbalists call it, Sia, there is duality. There is good and, and, and evil, and there's light and dark. So we are stuck having to be sensitive to that in this existence. But there will be a day when those two go together. I don't know if you were reading ahead, but that's number seven. Acknowledges the truth. That is a huge thing we're going to end on now, because I'm a little over. Uh, this time that we live in, yeah. what is truth? And how do we know truth? I would add a number eight. I would say... For number eight, I mean, I like all these, but number eight would be use as few words as possible. Because so many people, like, well, I'll say everybody, but I've run across numerous people that like to bloviate. Yeah. It's like hearing themselves talk. I feel attacked. <laughs> 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 Can you do that, Drew? Not you, Drew. No one in this room. These concepts don't just exist in isolation. isolation. Yeah. So when we talk about emet, when we talk about truth, Truth also exists with discretion. So a wise person is going to use discretion. They're going to use truth wisely, right? So none of us has the absolute sense in, as in every fact, right? Discretion tells you, I mean, every reporter knows and abuses it often in the modern world. Uh, there's, there's thousands of facts at, at any scene. The several that you select and present will oftentimes paint the picture and lead people a certain way that you want them to go to achieve an agenda. Yep. So if you're really, you know, truly seeking honesty, you're going to do that very democratically, right? Yeah, and that's, a, that's the problem today yes. because, right, like who, who holds the keys to that? And I think that's why this world is, is the, um, the battlefield that it is because we have to be extra humble when assuming we know what's going on in any situation. Because we're, 
for some reason, God is okay with us being in a certain degree of darkness in this reality for some purpose. Otherwise, he would solve it. So that's it. I'm way over. Um, next week, we will look at Mido, which gets a little bit deeper, a little bit more challenging. But this is one, I think, as a community. Let's, let's um, study these topics. The Talmud has two tractates. They're easy to read, or we can do Perkevo. What are the ethics we carry forward as a people, either in our family or in the community, that set us apart? How do we look different than the world around us, in a good way? Right? That's it.